Can you talk a little bit about the culture of R&D and how it's changed over the years? In the pharmaceutical industry and biotechnology. I've been watching this industry for the last four decades or so, and I have seen it evolve enormously. And in recent years, it's been accelerating. This change of paradigm and model has been dramatically. In the beginning, it was uh, uh, scientists in charge of this uh, research in the pharmaceutical industry. And as we move forward from organic chemists, they became biochemists, then biologists and MDs and clinicians. And nowadays, I think the majority of the leadership in pharmaceutical companies are uh, <coughs> MBAs and business people. So the culture of these two uh, segments of, of our society are quite different, of course, and so we have evolution of, uh, of things. In the old days, there was a lot of companies. Nowadays, we see acquisitions and mergers. We see layoffs. We, we see uh, outsourcing of research and development in, in Asia mainly. So uh, all these things are affecting, I think, the, the pipeline, which seems to be going down as opposed to up. And of course, there may be reasons for that uh, beyond the management style and so on. Um, but um, we we see uh, from emphasis of technology, I think, which originally was the um, the driving force for the R and D in pharmaceuticals, it was science and technology. Now we see more uh, business strategies driving this whole industry, which is very important for society. So we have um, developed more tools over the years. We have more ways to assess uh, pharmaceutical potentials. Um, but the pipeline still is declining. Why is that, do you think? Well, one can point to many reasons for that. Uh, and without pointing the finger to anybody, I think what you said is very true. Uh, we have enormous power now, both in chemistry and in biology, and the tools we use to make molecules and test them. Um, the pipeline seems to be smaller than it used to be. Perhaps one reason is that we have picked the low-hanging fruits already, and the challenges that remain, like cancer and Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, are extremely difficult problems, and, and, and progress there will be rather slow rather than sudden in a way. So um, this is why you see so much change and so rapidly change, changing models and paradigms in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so uh, hopefully with the new um, theme of personalized medicine, we will see certainly more drugs because we have to develop more of them to address individual groups of uh, patients uh, for the benefit of the patient, of course, and society in general. So many years ago in the old days, we used to take a chemical pretty much directly from the chemist uh, and put it into an animal model. And uh, some of the uh, legends of uh, drug research, uh, James Black, for instance, um, mm -hmm. made that approach very successful. Um, can you comment a bit on um, our um, ability to, to weave that kind of paradigm into our current system where we have so many assays between the chemistry and the biology. Absolutely. I think that's... Uh, <clears throat> so James Black was a, a giant in the field of drug discovery, of course, and won the Nobel Prize for his uh, innovative approach to medicine. I think there's something to be said about his approach because, after all, the molecules uh, <clears throat> being tested directly on tissues and organs is a much more relevant uh, test to carry out, and uh, but testing something against an isolated uh, biological receptor doesn't mean very much because receptors do not occur in our body in isolation. They're, they're working in a harmony with so many other um, ingredients that are found on the tissue and the organ. So that makes a lot of sense. So I think uh, going back to that model, I, would, I wouldn't mind it myself, <laughs> actually. But if you, what you said is very right. In fact, if you go even before James Black, you go to ancient times, people were directly uh, giving uh, natural uh, things and herbs to their bodies. And uh, out of that came aspirin in the end and, uh, and many other things. Uh, I'm not suggesting that, of course, but there is something to be said to go directly uh, as soon as possible into, into animals and perhaps uh, tissues of uh, the relevant tissues of humans and even humans themselves if we can, uh, of course, arrange carefully this uh, testing. And my last question is really about the conference. Um, I think we have a fine collection of people here. Can you talk a little bit about your experience of the conference and, and perhaps whether we need to do more of this? Mm, absolutely. I, I would like to really uh, congratulate COST and uh, organizers of this conference for a splendid um, blend of uh, 
uh, themes and topics and speakers and moderators. I think this has been an eye opener for me. I learned so much in this conference and perhaps in any other that I have been and I've been to many. Um, so um, I do encourage um, the organizers to continue this tradition to have it as a, a annual or biannual because this is clearly an emerging industry and a theme in medicine that's going to stay with us for a long time and developments will be rapid and fast and discussions need to continue because there are so many uh, issues to be resolved all the way from bioethics to philosophy and uh, healthcare for patients and uh, sustainability of the uh, healthcare course um, and targeted therapies for everyone. So uh, there is a lot to be um, discussed and decided upon and discover and uh, administer to patients. Thank you.